He always takes an innovative eye to whatever he tackles. His enthusiasm and passion for security is infectious. This is only an excerpt of what you can read on LinkedIn about our keynote speaker. And we are more than happy that he made all his way from San Francisco to Vienna to be here with us at sec 4 dev 2022 and to open this conference. Clint Gibler is the head of security research for Air2C, a startup working on giving security tools directly to developers. Before that, he was research director at NCC Group, a global security consulting firm, and there he helped companies implement security automation and DevSecOps best practices. He speaks a lot on global conferences. We just found out that Clint was 10 years ago here already in Vienna at Trust 2012. This was one of my first conferences at SBA as well. Um, but he also spoke at Black Hat, AppSec, and B-Sites, and today at sec for dev and the last two days he gave a boot camp and now he's here for open the conference so welcome with me clint and make sure to ask your questions in slido Cool. Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here uh, and honored to be invited. So thank you uh, to the organizers for having me. Uh, and yeah, welcome everyone to uh, the first day of sec for dev I'm excited you're here. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, so uh, the title of the presentation was originally uh, Scaling AppSec, but then the more I was thinking about uh, the conference and the opportunity here of having uh, just this wonderful opportunity in place to have both uh, developers and security uh, uh, working closely together, and I think building uh, empathy, building trust, uh, that seemed like such a uh, exciting opportunity to me that I wanted to sort of shift the focus a little bit um, to still talk about scaling security, but also uh, a bit about building relationships and uh, building the future together, and hopefully uh, maybe sharing a little context that uh, will sort of help us understand each other better and maybe try to shine a light on like why things are the way they are a little bit. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, so I, I think this is such uh, an exciting opportunity because truly, uh, I believe, maybe historically there's been a bit of siloing between engineering and development uh, and security, but I think really the future is sort of this uh, tight friendship and working together uh, closely and being uh, as best friends as we can be. Uh, Another thing um, that I just wanted to briefly touch on is that I think to uh, some people, or depending on who you ask, they may view uh, security and say writing high quality software or uh, just good engineering practices as maybe related, like maybe there's some overlap, uh, but they're not necessarily uh, the same thing. Uh, but to me, I really view uh, writing high quality software as uh, almost a security being a subset of that, right? If you uh, are writing very high quality software, you're uh, building software that does the intended features it's supposed to and uh, not anything else, uh, not sort of unintended behavior. And I think that the same approach and mindset that we can use to improve uh, software quality and robustness and performance at scale, uh, we can also apply that to uh, making software security better uh, at scale. And we'll talk about that more uh, in a second. But I think that reducing or improving software quality and velocity and reliability uh, can also improve security and uh, vice versa as well. But OK, before uh, we get into that, I had a, a pop quiz early in the morning to wake you up a little bit. Uh, so this is. Uh, a map of the United States, if uh, you're not familiar. And I grew up in a state called Ohio, which is uh, not necessarily the most visited state. Um, so I wanted to give you a quick quiz. Uh, who can guess which is Ohio uh, on the map? Uh, I see a lot of wincing in the audience. So um, yeah, so I guess raise your hand if you think Ohio is number one. <laughs> OK, uh, raise your hand if you think Ohio is number two. OK, OK, nice. Uh, raise your hand if you think Ohio is number three. OK, OK. Uh, what about number four? OK, OK, we got some good distribution of answers. Uh, and uh, what about number five? 
Oh man, people are very confident about number five. Okay. Um, all right, well, uh, I must uh, confess to you, uh, Ohio is actually number three, so congratulations <laughs> if you guessed number three. Uh, <laughs> And uh, if you guess number three, you uh, are better at American geography than about 90% uh, of Californians, where I currently live. Uh, so congratulations, uh, give yourself a pat on the back. And if you guessed anything else, you're, you're about the same as most uh, Californians and New Yorkers. So uh, yeah, uh, as uh, Yvonne mentioned, um, I have been in Vienna before in 2012. Uh, actually, the first academic paper uh, I ever had published in grad school was at Trust, which was in Vienna, and uh, I felt incredibly lucky. It was such uh, an amazing, wonderful experience, and people were very friendly, and uh, yeah, I, I loved it. So I'm very excited uh, and honored to be back. Uh, okay, I won't talk uh, much about myself because I think we already covered this, uh, but I work at R2C. We build SEMGRIP, an open source static analysis tool that uh, is aimed not just at security, but ideally also uh, helping developers do their job uh, better and faster. And um, yeah, before that, security consulting at NCC Group and uh, being a, an indentured servant, uh, I, I mean grad student at uh, UC Davis. Uh, and most recently, I was enjoying uh, some delicious uh, schnitzel here. So the most important of all the uh, background information. Um, Okay, uh, I also write a security newsletter where I try to uh, take the best like summaries, tools, and resources and put it into like one place uh, per week. Uh, it's free, comes out weekly. Uh, I also have a bunch of stickers uh, if you want them, and uh, a couple of people don't totally hate it, so uh, maybe you would like it. Um, but so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I was curious to learn uh, more about you all. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, uh, who here, uh, please raise your hand if you're a developer. Ah, oh, wonderful. Yeah, this is so exciting. Uh, I love it. Uh, what about if you're a uh, security professional or you have security in your title? Oh man, awesome. This is so great. Uh, what about uh, SRE or DevOps? Or, okay, cool. Nice. And uh, yeah, who is something else? Maybe you were, uh, okay, yeah, you were, you were walking by and you got lost and you walked in. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. <laughs> People are like, oh, I'm a painter. Um, well, you're going to learn a lot today. Uh, yeah, so um, talked a little bit about me, uh, a little bit about you. Thanks, thanks for uh, chiming in, making me feel welcome. Uh, so a couple things uh, I'm going to talk about in uh, the rest of the session. Um, so uh, a little bit of like history behind uh, development and security. I think how things were and maybe how they're changing a little bit. Um, why can security people be grumpy sometimes? Um, so maybe trying to build a little empathy here uh, and shared understanding. Um, going to talk about uh, some ideas that I've seen effective at a number of companies in terms of building better relationships between engineering and security. Uh, and then finally, some things I'm excited about, some trends that I think uh, are going really well and uh, that I see people investing in uh, more in the future uh, to be uh, just build more sort of scalable and effective engineering programs. Uh, okay, so this in itself we could talk about for uh, probably days, um, but just sort of like uh, looking at a couple of things that I think are meaningful. Um, so uh, you know, and all these are not strictly like this never happens now and it used to happen. Like obviously there's sort of shades of gray, but uh, in the past, say, uh, five, 10 or 20 years ago, uh, development tended to be more waterfall. So there was lots of upfront planning. Uh, you would m release maybe, uh, you know, once every quarter or every six months or every year or so and sort of things uh, moved a bit slowly. Um, now there's been broadly an adoption of agile development uh, methodologies where uh, planning happens more quickly. We're shipping code to production uh, perhaps daily, perhaps even dozens of times a day. Uh, we're storing uh, source code in, say, GitHub or places like that, and we're using a continuous integration uh, and continuous deployment approaches to just uh, always be testing and always be shipping. Uh, there used to be perhaps a separate uh, QA team who, you know, the developers write the software, separate team for testing it, uh, and that still happens uh, to some extent, but I think more often what I see at companies now is that the developers themselves are responsible for writing tests, whether that's, uh, you know, unit tests or integration or end-to-end -end tests. Um, so rather than separate teams, these are now sort of merged into one. 
<laughs> and going from sort of uh, deploying in uh, data centers or uh, hosting computers uh, or servers yourself uh, to more like cloud, like AWS, GCP, Azure, uh, and so forth. Um, so there's been a lot of changes here, right, uh, in terms of the, uh, the pace at which development happens, uh, the rate at which new features uh, are shipped to users, um, and where servers are. All of these things have changed a lot. Uh, and I think part of the, um, if at your company you experience uh, friction, perhaps, between development and security, part of that may be just um, security ha uh, has not caught up yet, and it's still learning some of, the, some of the same lessons that engineering has learned maybe five or 10 years ago. Um, so in security, I think historically there was a big focus on breaking things. So how do we find all the vulnerabilities? Uh, which, which does have some value, but I think uh, more recently a lot of um, security teams have become more like security engineering teams, also writing software and automations. And like how do we build security, uh, not just you know, find all the bad things? Uh, a lot of testing uh, historically was done like manually, like manually run tools, manually test web applications and things like that. Uh, now there's a much greater emphasis on automation uh, because that's what you need to scale. Uh, in the past there's been, um, I think uh, security people can uh, kind of have a reputation for maybe being a little bit grumpy or someone who says no or is slowing you down. Um, but one trend that I'm very excited about is uh, sort of high empathy, uh, very customer-centric uh, security teams who want to um, you know, help their engineering counterparts do their job uh, better, more effectively, and, and really help uh, the business go forward. Um, so along, along those lines, sort of double-clicking on, you know, why can security people be grumpy sometimes, um, I wanted to talk about this briefly for a couple of reasons. One is that I think um, in terms of building relationships, I think understanding uh, is often a useful first part of, like, empathy. Um, so from coming from the engineering side. And then from the security side, I think it's useful to think sometimes about, like, you know, why are things uh, the way they are and perhaps... Um, you know, are the beliefs we have or the ways that we've been doing things still constructive and still how we want to do things? Uh, and again, these are just broad gener generalizations. Uh, perhaps none of them uh, apply to you or your company, um, but they are things I've seen a little bit a couple of places, so I just uh, wanted to share. Uh, so pictured here is uh, someone who's about 25, they're just out of school, maybe three years into the industry, and uh, you know, this is after they used a lot of moisturizer. Um, so this is them on a good day. Uh, you know, security can be uh, stressful in some ways, and, and so let's look a little bit uh, at some reasons why. Um, so uh, one potential challenge is that like product and engineering, like this is bringing value to the business, right? You're building products and features and things that users are buying and uh, you're causing the business to go forward, right? Like without a product, without people building software, like you wouldn't have a business. And this can sometimes make security feel left out because they're like, yeah, I, uh, I'm just a cost center. Like you're, uh, I'm just trying to like, support this team that gets all the love and I, I'm just sort of, um, you know, in the background trying to like uh, make things not uh, explode. Um, so depending on the company culture, you know, this can be uh, a point of friction. Uh, another challenge is that security uh, leaders or security teams can get blamed when things go wrong. Uh, I think one of the most important principles in uh, doing post-mortems in engineering and development, like say you have a production outage or something bad happens, um, oftentimes you do uh, like a five whys session to say like, okay, why did this happen? Like here was the maybe process that should have been there that wasn't, uh, maybe there was some tooling we needed, uh, maybe there was user error, um, but really there's this like genuine uh, effort to try to understand like wh what happened here and why, and let's not blame anyone because that gets in the way of understanding like sort of the, the root cause. Um, but unfortunately, I think that culture eh, in some companies is there for security, but sometimes it's not. Um, I actually just you know did a quick Google like you know security person fired for breach, and there were like a bajillion uh, results. And I think that this can be. Uh, Frustrating because sometimes that same uh, security leader or team uh, did tell the business like way ahead of time like hey I see this risk or this potential risk we need to do something about it uh, and then basically it's not prioritized because uh, uh, future development reasons uh, or other business needs and then uh, when something inevitably bad happens because of the thing that they already warned the company about um, you know they're the one who sort of uh, 
faces uh, the negative consequences. So that can feel disempowering, where you're like, hey, I tried to do the right thing, I tried to do my job, but um, now I'm taking sort of the fall for that. Uh, so I've linked sort of two uh, slides from, uh, or uh, things from two different B-Sides SF uh, keynotes. Um, so the one uh, on the right is uh, by Jackie Bao um, called We Need More Mediocre Security Engineers. So it was a keynote at B-Sides SF this year. Uh, and I liked it because you talked about how uh, sometimes in security we have very high standards for ourselves, like things need to be perfect. Uh, there's so much to learn that I, I don't have time to have hobbies outside of work. I need to be like fully invested uh, in security. And she talked about a number of other things as well, but I, I thought that was very nice. Um, and then Asta from Netflix talked about building sustainable security programs where um, uh, sometimes there can be a focus on sort of uh, immediate problems or rather than like systematic long-term investments or um, like just a culture of firefighting and other things. So anyway, um, yeah, I'm going to link to these slides uh, at the end, but I also link to uh, some more um, sort of like a tweet thread overview of each of these talks and you can watch uh, their videos on YouTube as well. Um, but I thought, I thought these were both nice. But anyway, I, <coughs> I think... Uh, having a culture of burnout or high standards can uh, cause security people to be grumpy as well. Um, so another thing, um, if you're doing your job really well as a security team, like ideally nothing happens, there's no breach, you're not in the news, um, and I think um, it can be tough sometimes when, like, if you're doing everything really well, like, I guess the same is for conference organizing, when, like, when it's, uh, when the organizing is invisible, then it means you did an amazing job, and, like, uh, people might not think about it unless they actually, like, think, like, oh, wow, like, the food was always there, the swag was perfect, like, everything was amazing. Uh, and I think similarly for security, um, you know, we're, if we do a great job, it, it's kind of, like, transparent. Um, and also, you know, having to do every single thing right, like a million things right and only one thing uh, happening wrong um, for it to be a negative outcome, you know, that's tough too. Um, and again, perfection uh, that we just talked about. Uh, okay, mentioned this a little bit previously, but I think having a historical culture of people being breakers instead of builders uh, is also sometimes a point of friction. Um, where you're focusing on finding vulnerabilities, not fixing them. Uh, and I think you see that a bit in, uh, for people who've been in the security industry a long time, uh, they tend to not have a software development background. Like the first original people, I think were more like network security or sysadmin or, or people like that who didn't necessarily uh, write or read software. And that can make it hard to understand or empathize with development processes, like, because you, you, you've never maybe uh, participated in, like, a scrum meeting and, like, pushed code and, like, understand Git and, like, CICD and stuff like that. So it can be hard if you're not in that world to understand, like, hey, I just asked you to do this thing. Seems very easy to me. And then if you were actually had a more software engineering background, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that, that's going to take, like, 10 years to do. Like, we can't actually do that. Um, so anyway, so that's just like a, there's probably many others, but those are a couple of things that stick out to me in terms of, um, you know, why security people can have some challenges and why uh, they can be a bit um, grumpy at times. But I think, you know, more interesting is how can we build better relationships? So uh, I'd love to hear any ideas you all have uh, that, or that you've done in your uh, company that you found effective, uh, but here's a few that I've seen. Um, so the first is uh, cross-team embeds. Um, so basically someone on the security team spends a month or maybe a quarter um, literally just being on an engineering team. So uh, attending all the same meetings, shipping software, um, uh, doing code reviews, and just basically, uh, like maybe you still have like a security perspective, but everything you're doing, you're taking features from whoever your like product manager is uh, and things like that. Um, and I think this is really valuable for understanding how code is uh, both written and shipped to production. Uh, you can understand uh, new, say, tooling or processes the security team might be wanting to include uh, in, say, your pipeline. You're like, oh, yeah, like, I know that this has nice security value, but based on when I was writing software, like, that's going to add 15 minutes to my day, like, five times a day. Like, I can't, I can't do that. So I think that perspective is very valuable. Um, and it helps you build allies on different teams, um, as well as empathy and trust. So uh, after the embed, you may go back to uh, your own team, and then uh, everyone on your team who is now your buddies is like, oh, hey, like, we have this security question. I'm going to ask the person I know uh, because they've lived in my uh, shoes and uh, written software with us. Um, and so I've seen teams uh, do this both ways. So someone on an engineering team will just spend a month or a quarter on a security team and um, 
yeah, uh, pretty much, I think, I think Segment and a couple of other companies have done this, uh, and pretty much every company I've heard of who've done this uh, have generally liked it a lot and gotten a lot of value from it. Um, Another fun fact is uh, I uh, didn't make this meme. It like already existed, and I, I knew about it. Um, but I thought it was like applicable because of uh, I don't know German and anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I had some like notes to myself. I was like, oh, this is the perfect one. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> I think another thing you can do is uh, ask for help. Um, so if you're uh, uh, an engineer or developer, um, uh, maybe part of you is like, ah, I don't want to burden the security team. They always seem busy. Um, I don't want to like sort of put upon them by asking for help. Uh, I can guarantee you um, they will probably not feel like that. Um, every security person I know, uh, whenever uh, an engineering colleague reach out, reaches out to them, they're super excited. They're like, oh man, like it was so great. Like they were unsure of, uh, uh, they were building a new microservice and they were curious about how to do like authorization within the context of the broader ecosystem and they reached out and um, uh, I bet they will be thrilled uh, to help you. Um, and I think similarly security, like how can we make it easy for people to ask questions by having perhaps a well-defined place uh, that people can ask, whether that's uh, a mailing list or a Slack or Teams channel um, or uh, maybe a wiki page that defines like some common like FAQ or something. Um, but also I think, of course, like be kind. So uh, if someone asks you a question, um, you know, treating them with uh, respect and trying to be as helpful as possible and not um, uh, being like, oh, like you should know this already uh, and things like that. Okay, so we'll uh, talk more about this uh, in more detail in, in a second, but I think one thing I see uh, that's very effective and powerful for increasing engineering uh, velocity and quality uh, and just scaling uh, to as your company grows, as well as security, is this concept of building a paved road. So um, uh, standardizing on, say, libraries, tooling, how you deploy software, your pipelines, and things like that, and basically just collectively deciding, like, this is how we want to do things. Uh, let's make it really easy to do it that way, and then let's gradually uh, try to get some sort of uh, homogeneity and just, like, push everyone sort of down this one way. Um, and when you have, uh, rather than, say, uh, 10 teams doing things 50 different ways, if you gradually have some agreement on how things happen, you can really invest in making sure that those uh, uh, tools, libraries, and processes are very performant. Maybe they have logging and visibility built in, so you don't have to like solve the same problem many times. Uh, you can also build like security primitives in there as well. Um, and ideally, you're just building these sets of like building blocks or functionality um, that can be easily and just widely used uh, by everyone instead of a bunch of uh, one-offs. Um, I think one uh, powerful insight is security teams, if you have a uh, platform engineering team or some uh, team in your company that is uh, responsible for basically writing software that other uh, engineering teams use, uh, like becoming best friends with them, uh, the security team and them, like you're both uh, sort of customer centric in that you're writing software uh, to be consumed by your internal colleagues. Um, so I think that's like a really natural partnership and ideally you can be uh, sort of besties. Um, and one quote that I really like from uh, Patrick and Asta of Netflix is, uh, hitch your security wagon to developer productivity. So how can we make uh, the secure way even faster, easier, more performant, uh, and things like that? So we'll talk more about this in, uh, in a second. Um, so I think, yeah, one of the last things, uh, building shared capabilities. So where are their mutual wins? Uh, so there's many things that fall under this bucket. I'll just give you two examples. Um, but I think tools, libraries, or infrastructure that help um, like developer productivity or quality or performance, robustness, things like that, as well as security, uh, is so nice because uh, you don't need to, um, say, convince engineering teams to use something that just has a better user experience. And um, you know, engineers, you can focus on uh, what you want to do, which is like you know, building uh, awesome new features and shipping new products products and not having to worry uh, about security because it's kind of um, transparent and orthogonal and happens all around you uh, for free. Um, so 
two examples. First example, uh, asset inventory. Um, so this is useful for security in terms of like, what are all the devices we have? Uh, where are they? Uh, what servers do we have? What services do we have running on these uh, applications? And basically just understanding your environment, right? You need to know what's there in order to protect it. You need to know things about it. Um, but this is useful for many teams, right? So for DevOps and SRE teams, if you're trying to troubleshoot something, you need to know like, um, you know, who owns this uh, repo? When was it last deployed? Um, what are its dependencies? Stuff like that. Uh, for your cloud environment, for example, the finance team might care about uh, how many uh, servers do we have? Uh, where are they? Uh, which um, like cloud features are we using? Um, and then from an engineering point of view, you know, what do we have? Where is it? Um, how are things going? Um, so it's really this same uh, functionality, but it's super useful for many people. So rather than trying to exclusively focus on what can help you win, like think like, oh, how can I make this solution maybe a little bit more generalizable and uh, helpful to more uh, teams? Second example, code scanning, um, obviously useful for security if you're looking for uh, security issues as software is being written, um, but also for engineering in terms of uh, ensuring code standards uh, are being applied at scale rather than having them just on a wiki page somewhere. You can actually check every new pull request to say, hey, um, you know, uh, this is how to write performance software, or we used to have this API, but now we're doing this uh, other API. Um, and also, like helping onboard new developers. Uh, maybe you have a specific ways in which software is written at your company uh, from either a stylistic or just which APIs you use, uh, for example, in like common libraries or internal libraries. Uh, and being able to do like a just-in-time education where it's like, hey, you just push, uh, you push some new code for the first time. Uh, you're writing software this way, but actually like this is how we do it. Um, so you can sort of scale that knowledge rather than um, requiring people to always write the same thing on um, pull requests as comments, for example, during code review. Um, Okay, so uh, my friend Zane Lackey, who used to be the uh, director of security at Etsy, the uh, online marketplace, uh, told me a very cool story once about his uh, single best, most effective security spend. Um, and I'm curious uh, if anyone in the audience wants to guess uh, what it was. So it could be, could be anything, and it might not be what you think. Was it funny and smart ass? Um, a little bit. It was a little bit funny. Yeah, you know what it is, so. <laughs> someone who isn't into security. Sorry? Buying for someone who isn't into security. Okay, buying someone not in security dinner. Um, yeah, very close. Yeah, it's, def it's definitely along that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll just. Uh, oh. Training, maybe? Training? Okay, yeah, yeah, training is a, is a good idea. Yeah, definitely useful. Um, yeah, any, anyone else want to share some ideas? So uh, it was actually a jar of candy. Um, so what he ended up doing is he bought a, a jar of candy and put it next to the, uh, where the security team sat in the Etsy office. And uh, basically what would happen is uh, periodically, maybe like a few times a day or at least a few times a week, uh, someone would, uh, an engineer would come by and just, um, you know, like try not to th make it look like they were just obviously coming there only for the candy. Um, so they'd be like, you know, like mosing around, like uh, grab some. And then uh, inevitably what would happen is like uh, they would, they would be like, taking some candy, eating it, and then they'd be like, oh, like, by the way, yeah, there was, there was this thing I was working on that I was curious about, like, how do, I, how do I do this the right way? Or, oh, by the way, there's this thing that we're building, and like, yeah, no one from security has looked at it, and I kind of think it's a dumpster fire, so like, yeah, maybe, maybe we need help. Um, but it just uh, created this opportunity for uh, organic interactions that were very low stakes. It wasn't like a meeting was called. It wasn't like they were um, potentially going to have to delay their release or something like that. It was just very informal, very casual. Um, um, but it led to uh, a huge amount of uh, visibility on the security team's part in terms of like, oh, here's what people are building, uh, here's some things that people have questions about and need help with, and um, it's also just like uh, such a low-stakes friendly way um, to, uh, 
to meet people and, and get help. And uh, similarly, yeah, to your point, he said the second most was uh, basically the, um, the bar tab bill where he would uh, invite a couple of different people from different uh, software and engineering teams to just hang out, grab some drinks, and uh, inevitably, uh, after one or two rounds, uh, there was like tons of good uh, conversation. Um, but yeah, I, I thought this was such uh, an interesting idea. And ultimately, I think sort of the principle here is how um, can we create uh, better uh, relationships and friendships between teams and also just create opportunities for organic uh, low stakes discussions. So I think there's probably many ways to do that. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to think about how you can do that maybe in your company. Uh, okay, so last topic, uh, a few things that I'm excited about. Uh, so I'm excited about security teams who view themselves as customer-centric. Uh, so they view themselves as um, kind of how product teams are supposed to be customer-obsessed by building uh, software for their users, like external people from your company uh, that pay you money. Uh, similarly, I think modern security teams uh, are adopting sort of a customer-centric view where their customers are their engineering colleagues, and they're thinking, like, how can I make my customers uh, more effective, happier, more productive? Uh, and things like that. Uh, similarly, this view of um, like guardrails, not gatekeepers. So how can we provide the structure and systems with which uh, engineering can be very effective and not be um, sort of like a, a Gandalf type character where you're always like slamming your staff and saying, you know, you can't pass here, you can't do that. Um, I, I think uh, security teams that realize they only have like a couple of no's to give like per year, uh, I think can be very effective because rather than say, no, you can't do that, like, hey, yes, you can do that, but let's uh, figure out a way where you can do that in a way um, that uh, makes the risk uh, acceptable. Um, Ecosystems keep getting better, so I think modern web frameworks are very exciting. Uh, they output and code by default. They handle session management, like with cookies, and they do all these sorts of things for you uh, in a way that they didn't used to. And I think that's been a big cause of uh, just security getting better across uh, the web uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I think browser security has been getting better in a way that's very interesting. Um, so, for example, I think uh, Philippe is going to be talking about trusted types uh, and a couple of other things soon. Um, and uh, uh, the same site, Cookie Paul policy, for example, is uh, making cross-site request forgery go down, um, so there's exciting stuff there. And then finally, uh, memory-safe languages, right? So uh, replacing C and C++ with Golang, Rust, uh, and languages like that. Um, but the last topic, uh, secure guardrails, um, that I want to go to in a little bit more detail uh, is one that I'm kind of most excited about, perhaps. So, so I have like a like a brief little, uh, I guess, introduction um, to this idea of uh, secure defaults and guardrails. Where I'm going to make uh, maybe an intuitive argument for why I think this is very powerful, uh, give you some examples of companies using this approach, and. Um, Overall, happy to chat about uh, you know why this is hard sometimes, uh, but why it can still be effective. Um, so this idea of secure defaults or secure guardrails or sort of paved road, as Netflix likes to call it, is the idea that rather than trying to sort of one-off find bugs, we're instead trying to kill entire bug classes, building sort of these scalable, systematic, long-term wins. Um, so anything that's like just fixing one thing one time, de-emphasizing that and figuring out instead how do we build uh, um, systems and tools that make whole groups of things uh, impossible. So we want to make developers move fast and securely, um, and then ideally as security teams be business enablers, not another point of friction. Um, okay, so let's say I showed you a random web application you'd never seen before, uh, and I asked you, you know, does this have cross-site scripting in it? Uh, so realistically, there would probably be a number of questions you have about that, like what does the user control? What's the structure of the data? Is input filtered before it's sent to the database? Is it stored as like ints or booleans or maybe raw JSON? Uh, what's the database type? Is it Postgres, MySQL, something else? Uh, is data processed before it's sent back to the user? And also, like, how is it rendered to the user uh, in, say, just directly HTML or HTML attribute, JavaScript? Like, there's all these questions you would have probably to make an informed uh, opinion about uh, sort of the security properties of this system. Uh, but let's say instead of answering all those questions, I just had this guardrail that was always enforced where 
we could say, hey, the front end is React, and we've banned this function uh, dangerously set in our HTML, which sort of disables the framework's protections on uh, output encoding. So it sort of says, um, you know, hey, like I, I trust this input, um, uh, don't make it safe. Um, so if if we were to basically remove the way that uh, things can be made unsafe, uh, these other things like still matter a little bit, but I think uh, not nearly as much as they used to, um, because we've sort of eliminated like large class of like bad things that can happen. So cross-site scripting can still happen, but uh, it's more like edge cases and one-offs rather than like you have to do the right thing uh, everywhere because we made good uh, framework choices. Uh, and the way that I think about this is, you know, how can we solve the easy version of the problem? Like, you can't make it harder on yourself, but why? Um, so this app could have been very complex, maybe millions of lines of code, uh, but with some sort of strong uh, secure defaults and some properties or like invariants we're enforcing uh, about the code, we've significantly reduced its risk, even if there's a lot of things we still don't know about it. Uh, another way I think about this is, you know, what is the thing we're trying to do versus how much effort does it take to accomplish that? Um, so the uh, units here on the y-axis uh, are CHUs or uh, Clint's hand wavy units. Um, so feel free to use these units as well uh, when you're making charts, um, when you're making an intuitive argument that uh, has no units and uh, doesn't make sense uh, to some people perhaps. Um, but so. Basically, like down here, let's say we're trying to detect either the use or the lack of use uh, of a secure library. Um, that's actually pretty easy, right? You can kind of just grep for the library being included or certain function calls being made. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. But if you're trying to find something that's potentially a bug that requires greater uh, analysis complexity, trying to confirm if something is a real bug uh, takes even more and maybe some uh, manual human review and writing a proof of concept exploit showing, yes, this is exploitable and here's input that does that, uh, that's even more work. So the idea is like, if our goal is to write secure software uh, and eliminate classes of issues, like. Can we get the same outcome with much less work uh, from both like a human time as well as like analysis complexity? Um, and I think that by like focusing on classes of issues, there's also um, major like efficiency gains here. Um, so this is like a hypothetical security team. I just sort of made up this pie chart, but imagine you did a time audit of your security team and you're like, hey, this is kind of how we're spending time. We're doing some threat modeling. We're running some security tools. We've got a couple of vulnerabilities that we are either manually finding or uh, helping developers remediate, or maybe we're responding to like pen tests or bug bounty or, or things like that. Um, so let's say you were like, hey, this cross-site scripting thing, it's kind of a problem, uh, let's invest in a secure by default library and get everyone to use it, and then assuming that the library is rolled out effectively and it's doing the right thing, then maybe there's this whole class of things that you've mostly solved and you just all the time you used to be spending uh, at that, you can then invest into something else. So say maybe after that you're like, uh, SQL injection, okay, let's like tackle that next. And sort of the, the idea here is um, by not solving one-off problems, but trying to like systematically solve classes of things. You can spend all the time you used to be spending there on uh, somewhere new and ideally become sort of compoundingly more effective over time with the same number of people uh, on your team. So there's also sort of a, a business case to be made here um, to upper management uh, if that can help you get buy-in. So I guess sort of the argument I'm trying to make here is that detecting the use or lack of use of secure defaults is just much easier than finding bugs, but assuming they're done well and done effectively, uh, you don't sort of have to find the bugs because they can't happen uh, by construction. Uh, Okay, so you might be thinking, you know, you've just shown me some hand wavy diagrams, like that's cool, uh, but the security industry has been focusing on bug finding for a long time. So like, why should we change? We already have all these fancy tools, like static analysis tools, dynamic analysis tools, pen test, bug bounty, and like so many other things. Like, you know, you know that, that's just you, Clint. Um, so let's look at a couple of other companies uh, and what they're talking about. Um, so this is a Apps at Cali talk from a couple of people at Netflix, uh, and you can see this is sort of strategically how they're investing in their program. Um, so on the de-emphasized side, uh, manual testing and traditional vulnerability scanning, and on the uh, right-hand side, um, they're looking at uh, building a paved road. So again, like how can we make the uh, easy thing uh, the secure thing, and then also killing bug classes? Like how do we systematically reduce uh, many 
uh, security risks instead of just one at a time. Uh, this was a neat study by Microsoft where they found that in the transition from XP to Vista, uh, basically banning stir copy and other dangerous functions caused a 41% uh, vulnerability reduction. Right, so that's like pretty pretty big vulnerability reduction by just like saying, hey, don't don't use these dangerous functions anymore. Uh, this is a book uh, that you can actually download for free uh, online uh, by Google that I think is uh, really great from their SRE and security teams. Uh, and I, I like their approach here. They say it's unreasonable to expect any developer to be an expert in all of these things, for example, uh, all the sort of security nuances. A better approach is to handle security and reliability in frameworks, languages, and libraries. Um, and ideally, the libraries uh, expose interfaces that make writing code with common classes of vulnerabilities impossible. So again, this idea of how can we make um, security sort of an orthogonal concern to people uh, shipping features? Because I, I think that this is a really fair assumption, right? It's, I think it's important for um, you know, developers to learn about security, and that's why events like sec are amazing, and we should keep having them. Uh, but at the same time, it's also very hard to write software quickly and effectively and on schedule and scalably and make it robust. And like, there's so many concerns that you need to develop expertise in. Um, so how can we sort of lower the bar um, where you can be uh, maybe not a security expert, but just like aware of areas of security that are potentially like filled with landmines so that you know like how uh, to avoid them or ask for help at the right times. Uh, here's a blog post from the artist uh, formerly known as Facebook, um, where uh, basically they have like an inverse pyramid where at the top they try to catch sort of the most bugs and then they have uh, sort of a defense in depth at each level where they try to like, you know, catch the things the above layer missed. But the, the top layer, so the most important layer that they invest a lot in is uh, building frameworks that help engineers prevent and remove entire classes of bugs uh, when writing code. So again, this emphasis on frameworks. Um, Okay, so we thought these were, this was interesting. People were uh, uh, like, hey, this is how we do things, but uh, we, we kind of wanted some data behind this. Um, so some colleagues of mine gave a talk at Besides SF this past time where uh, basically what we did was um, we built some crawling and scraping. Um, so we looked at uh, a huge number of commits on GitHub from either BigQuery or the Code Search API and basically tried to find commits that were fixing cross-site scripting in open source code. Um, so the commit message would have something like fix XSS or something like that. And basically, the idea was, can we find for the commits fixing cross-site scripting, uh, was there like a framework level protection they were opting out of which caused them to be vulnerable? So if they were to not opt out of protections or use what sort of their framework gave them, could they have avoided this uh, in the first place? And basically, sort of short story, um, about 60% of the time, uh, there was something, uh, either a framework protection or something they could have used that basically would have caused that cross-site scripting not to happen in the first place. Um, so there's still more we want to do in this space, but I think this is some initial evidence that like, yeah, the, this actually, in in practice in the real world uh, is effective. Uh, so you might be thinking, hey, like I'm not Google, I don't have infinity money, um, but you don't need to be. I think if you make the right uh, framework and technology choices, uh, choosing like modern frameworks, uh, you can mitigate classes of issues from happening in the first place. Uh, there's a bunch of open source repos that do individual things, I think, quite well, and there's many besides this, but for um, like sanitizing XSS, there's DOM Purify, for um, like Regex's RE2, for Crypto, Tink, uh, and so forth. Um, so again, you don't need to build everything yourself. There are good things out there that can uh, save you some time and effort. Um, so I'll link to this in the slides, uh, but we did uh, give another talk at a Global AppSec SF and a couple of other places about tackling entire vulnerability classes and sort of the, just wanted to call out sort of the high level methodology that we discussed is first, you know, which vulnerability class should we focus on? Um, you know, what's most common? What's highest impact? Determining how do we find or prevent it at scale? Selecting what good looks like and making it the default everywhere. Uh, training people to use the safe pattern and then finally using tools to enforce the safe pattern uh, is used. So a number of companies have followed approaches like this to sort of tackle entire vulnerability classes. So um, I'll link to the slides uh, in the updated version of these slides um, uh, to give you like some more detail. But um, 
Anyway, uh, so that is basically what I wanted to chat about today. So uh, a little bit about how things have changed, a little bit about why uh, security people can be grumpy, some ways to build relationships, and hopefully uh, I've convinced you using some hand-wavy arguments that uh, secure defaults are uh, ideally a good idea or at least not a terrible idea. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy uh, to answer questions with uh, any remaining time. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So I, I love the idea with the chocolate. Um, I think chocolate always works. So there's a question, what's your favorite candy actually is? Sorry, what's, what's my... What's your favorite candy, somebody asked. My favorite candy? Yeah, because you talked about the chocolate. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I do like uh, Snickers bars, um, but I have had some delicious uh, Viennese chocolates, so that's up there as well. Awesome. So uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, some of them are because you said that uh, security is, is transparent. So some people were asking, um, how can I show my managers that the security team is doing a great job when the success is transparent? And somebody said, nothing too bad happened might not be enough. To, to communicate that to the management. Yeah, totally. Um, that, that is a common challenge I've heard at a number of companies where it's like, hey, uh, we gave you a million dollars last year, we didn't have a breach, now you're asking for two million, like why? One million was fine last year. Like what is the, how do you measure the incremental improvement? Um, so I think that um, like breach or things like that is definitely, um, not a good metric because you could be doing great security and, and still get uh, have something bad happen. So I think there's other metrics that are useful. Um, so for example, you could uh, like basically how many vulnerabilities of what type and what severity are we discovering, whether that's from like bug bounty, pen test, uh, internal tools or things like that. And not just how many are we discovering because that's also potentially a misnomer, right? Because you could, um, let's say you're not doing any scanning today, you start doing scanning tomorrow, all the sudden you're finding more vulnerabilities, like your security is not worse, you just are aware of what's already there. Um, so I think some metrics around basically how well are we discovering issues and then um, basically what is like the time to fix. Um, and uh, you can use external reports like maybe bug bounty pen test as like a general barometer of like, you know, we used to have this many reports per month which cost us this much, now it's like 30% less. Um, so clearly something we're doing is, is better. So I think the short answer is it's complicated, but I think choosing metrics metrics that um, you have more data for uh, is one good way. So like time to fix, uh, number of vulnerabilities you're finding and by what methods and how severe they are, stuff like that. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Um, then we have a question um, from the developer side as well, like how to convince my boss. The question is, as a developer in a startup project, how can you convince management to address security issues in a timely manner, even if they have no market value? Mm, even if it has no market value? Um, that's a good question. Um, so, yeah, you could try to make an argument that's, um, you know, the reason people are paying us in the first place is because they have at least some trust in our platform and that by having a breach or things like that um, it damages our brand, which causes potentially fewer people to pay us. Um, there's also, I think, various uh, uh, regulatory things or compliance or other things where if you, say, lose uh, people's private information, there could perhaps be a GDPR fine. So there is also like a compliance or like financial risk there as well. Um, I think... Um, Ultimately, another argument could be like, hey, if we wait to do security at the end, it's going to be more work. So it's actually less work to do it earlier, and it's going to disrupt. Uh, like, we're never going to have to hold back a launch because we're taking security into mind earlier. Um, so there's, I think, like a developer productivity angle there, where it's like, hey, you know how like we have to keep interrupting development because we get this like uh, P1 or P0 issue come in. Um, we could stop interrupting development as much if we just invested in security a little bit earlier, uh, which would like basically let us focus more and get more things done faster. Um, so I guess like appealing to sort of like business value, development productivity, um, and maybe just uh, pride in writing uh, good software. Like I think every company likes to believe that they write good software and I think pitching security as one property in that uh, is valuable. And maybe just making it part of people's like comp or something like that in terms of like, I don't know, if security is going down, then that's tied to like your bonus or something. I don't know. Maybe that's too much. Um, maybe last two questions. So um, why write your own XML parser? 
Uh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned like briefly on the slide like uh, secure defaults. One of them was like XML parsing. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, sorry, I should have worded that better, I think. Um, I don't mean write it from scratch. I mean that uh, for many languages, the sort of out-of-the-box standard library XML parsing uh, will, um, uh, there's potential foot guns there. I, I think like in Java, for example, um, you need to make sure to like disable the right bits so that it's not insecure. Um, some languages it's good, like I think Golang, for example, makes cr uh, XXE very hard, but uh, I think like, uh, XML or JSON parsing, there's been a number of talks over the past few years about how if you parse malicious files, uh, it can lead to, like, say, arbitrary code execution or stealing information from the server. So I think that whatever language and ecosystem you use, if you're parsing XML or JSON or YAML or things like that, um, just see if people are writing about, like, how to use those libraries securely, um, because I think it's one area that... Um, depending on your language and ecosystem is like not secure by default, but, but don't write like XML parsing library from scratch. Maybe use an existing library and then figure out what are the settings you need to uh, flip to make it secure and then only expose an API that does that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, last question. In a heterogenic stack, um, e.g. vertical sliced setup or microservices, how do you approach security? Hmm. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the first part? So, uh, in like a monolith versus microservices, or um, in a heterogenic stack, hmm. and then e.g. vertical sliced setup with microservices, micro FE, different owners um, involving in their own, etc. How do you approach security? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so if you have a heterogeneous stack where uh, there's many different languages perhaps being used in different microservices, um, yeah, so one, uh, I guess, way in which you can invest in secure defaults is uh, at, say, like a language level, like say, we, this is how we do this thing in Python or Java or things like that. But that can be hard if you have, say, five or ten languages that are maybe used a similar amount or there's not like a clear sort of winner. Um, so one way I've seen um, solving these types of problems in heterogeneous environments is there's things you can do um, at maybe bigger than a language specific level. So for example, if you can implement some sort of security properties as like a sidecar uh, or in like a service mesh or in things uh, in like a, a proxy, for example, that like all the microservices, regardless of what they're written in, can go through, uh, that's one way to have some scalable wins. Um, I think um, Dropbox had a nice talk from AppSec Cali uh, a few years ago where basically they had a bunch of internal applications um, that didn't have great security. They were for like just uh, Dropbox using it rather than like external users. And basically they put sort of this uh, identity aware proxy in front of it that every uh, user had to go to, which basically said, hey, you're using a modern browser uh, and you're using SSO and like various other security properties. So I guess if you can't put security uh, as effectively within like the source code itself, maybe adjacent to it, whether that's like sidecar, service mesh, uh, proxy that everything needs to go to, uh, that's another potential solution as well. Um, you also don't have to do everything at once, right? So you don't need to like build a secure version for everything day zero. It could be like, uh, hey, 70% of uh, our code bases use Java. We have maybe this type of vulnerability seems to happen the most. Okay, let's just like try to tackle that over the next quarter. And it's sort of uh, being uh, methodical, methodical and willing to invest in a longer period of time, um, which does, to, to someone earlier's question, uh, take some uh, executive buy-in. Um, but hopefully you can show them Clint's hand wavy units and, and they'll be a, a believer. But, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Clint. And we have some chocolate for you, actually. <laughs> oh, and uh, if you want, I, I have some stickers that I'll, I'll leave up here. They're a cute little robot. Yeah, so you are here for all the lunch break later? Still? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yeah. I'll be here uh, through the end of uh, tomorrow. So awesome. I'll be here the whole time. Awesome, great. So this is for you. Thanks so much. Oh, for thank you so much. Some Viennese chocolate and other Austrian food. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.